So welcome to the Silicon Valley, you know, the tech center of the world uh, where the microphones are not really working. That's normal. When I came here, there were some dead spots where my cell phone connection always broke. So when you're driving in the morning with the calls to Europe, uh, through the very one intersection, always my cell phone connection dropped. Uh, uh, but then I didn't dial in anymore because I just parked the car and was already in the office and could participate. So welcome. Thank you very much for coming uh, this evening. Uh, I know we have a lot of opportunities and things, what to do in the evening, so I appreciate that you made the time coming here. I also understood that we have some people from Switzerland here. Herzlich willkommen, yeah. Merci fürs Kommen. Uh, und auch Österreicher, so viel ich gesehen, Austrians, uh, as far as seen, yeah. He looks like me, so you know Arnold Schwarzenegger is from Switzerland, uh, is from Austria, so we all look like that. Uh, some Germans here? Thank you. Thank you. Herzlich willkommen ebenso. And of course, the rest, everyone else who is here. Thank you for coming. Uh, I've been here for 17 years uh, in Silicon Valley. Originally, actually, I studied chemical engineering. I'm a chemical engineer. My PhD was on exhaust emissions of two heating fuels. One heating fuel is diesel. Um, I never thought that I have anything else to do with diesel fumes. But 20 years later, of course, the diesel scandal in with the German car makers hit the world. So suddenly I'm kind of in that thing. I never worked as a chemical engineer. I worked for SAP, the German software company here, first in Germany, then over here in uh, SAP Labs Palo Alto. Did development, software development uh, in the last year's technology and trend research. I was an innovation strategist. And now I'm basically my own company. Uh, and I write books on the research, and one was The Last Driver License Holder, where I realized that what we see here in Silicon Valley is very different to what uh, friends and colleagues who work in the German automotive industry and people who come over here visiting us know. And I realized there's a knowledge gap here, so I wrote this book. This book came out in October last year, so some of the numbers are already outdated but still a good read. Uh, it's coming out in English with updated versions uh, here uh, with a large American publisher in New York. But before I talk too much about that stuff, let's dive in into artificial intelligence, autonomous car, and generally what's happening to the automotive industry, thanks to the work here of people in Silicon Valley. Um, and I call it the last driver license holder is already born. And this is Max. Max is a cutie pie. He just celebrated his second birthday. He uh, got a lot of gifts and balloons, but of course, uh, as you may realize, he's the last person on earth making a driver's license. Uh, you may now say, Mario, you can be as much as you want a PhD and smarts, but this is bullshit. Uh, uh, we don't believe you in that. And I say, you are absolutely right in dissing me because it may be Sophie, or it may be, you know, a girl Paula in Rio, or a girl in Zurich, or a boy in, I don't know, Paris, or somewhere else. But one thing is sure, uh, the last person who makes a driver's license on this planet is already here amongst us. And in order to talk about the future, let me go a little bit back into the past. Uh, and let's go back to the year 2016, because 2016 was the year where I, from Austria, we in Austria, we commemorate our last emperor, Franz Josef, who brought us Sissi. Some of you have may have seen the movie. Uh, but he also uh, owned and liked these horse carriages. And this were basically this horse carriage that I saw in the Imperial Carriage Museum was the Porsche of its time, an elegant, luxurious sports coach. The, the emperor sat on top. He did not sit here. He sat on top, conducted it himself. Yeah. He liked it so much that there are still six of those carriages, uh, of these very same carriages in the museum, 24 carriages from that maker. And the coachmaker's name was Karl Marius. I do not get any feedback here. Uh, Karl Marius. I mean, this was the coach maker of the emperor, right? 
everyone should know him. Why, 100 years later, do we not know about this guy anymore? I mean, come on, Porsche, Rolls Royce, these are the car makers for, for today's kings and emperors and presidents, right? Uh, what happened to him? Well, the future happened to him, right? The automotive industry, the automotive revolution happened to him and replaced him. Uh, and when we look actually at the backgrounds of those automotive pioneers that we're talking about, like Carl Benz, Henry Ford, Johann Puch, Gottlieb Daimler, and I just listed a few of them, there are hundreds of them, and look at the backgrounds, we see what? We see the mechanical engineers, mechanics, metal workers, clerks, electricians, industrialists, but what professions are missing here? Coachmaker, stable owner, horse breeders, all these professions that were relevant for the coach industry, right? And almost none of them made it into this new industry. So typically when you see uh, pioneers with very different backgrounds, you know there is disruption going on in this industry. And we come later to that back. The only one or one of the few that I saw who was a coach maker uh, and made it into the automotive industry was Studebaker. Studebaker started out as a coach maker. Um, now, maybe you heard it from your grandparents or great grandparents. I want to remind you of the horse shit crisis of 1894. And you have to know that back then in New York and London, there were each 100,000 horses, uh, quickly growing, fast growing cities. And each horse, you know, defecates around 7 to 15 kilogram of horse shit every day. Uh, that's, that's basically up to 30 pounds, think about 15 to 50 pounds. And uh, 1 to 2 liters of urine is half a gallon of urine that it releases on the street. Uh, so in summer, when it was dry, that, that was the pile of horse manure. Uh, the wind blew through that, it was flying all around, yeah, you had it in your nostrils and everywhere. And in rainy season, winters, it looked like that was a mud thing, so you had it on your shoes. And that's why in, in Europe, in these cities that were built around 1800, 1900, you see in front of these doors always these metal pieces where you could basically wipe off the, the dirt. That was exactly the dirt that we're talking about on these streets. Now, the, New, the London Times in 1894 predicted that 50 years from now, that means 1944, with the growth of the cities, the P expected, every street in London will be covered under three meters, nine feet of horse shit. Well, it's a very pleasant, uh, ima uh, you know, picture that we can see here. It goes up to the ceiling here, uh, but it never happened because, of course, an invention came, an innovation came that disrupted this old industry, and horses were a thing of the past. So this is a picture from 1900, the Fifth Avenue in New York. Some of you may have seen that already from Tony Saber. And this is a typical traffic situation that we have here. Yeah? Uh, horse carriages, pedestrians. And there are actually one or two or three cars hidden there. Can anyone see this? this devil's contraption, making all this noise that's smelly and stinky and always breaks down. So here is one, yeah? and I think somewhere up there is another, uh, another car. I think this one is the car that we have here. So that was the traffic situation in 1900. Now fast forward, 1913, same street, uh, very different scenario. Suddenly, almost only cars, right? And uh, still there's a, there's, a, there's a few lonely horse carriages in there. Who can spot them? Look precisely. So, so here's one. And I think we have here one because there's a buggy whip. And there must be a second one. I think there's a second buggy. But basically on the, on the descending uh, path towards oblivion here. And that is something in this industry, in the automotive industry, that happened within 13 years. Now we are 2018, and we come back to that narrative later. Now today we don't have the bus shit crisis, we have the traffic uh, jam, truck crisis, and parking problems, and all this kind of stuff, where we're wasting a lot of resources and, and, and uh, losing a lot of productivity uh, because of this situation. So another 
thing, another trend that we see is that over the years, over the last decades, few and few people make driver's licenses. Uh, I recently was in Lyon in France where there is an, uh, a make of an autonomous shuttle bus, uh, Navia is the name, they have 220 employees and uh, only 20% of their employees have a driving license only 20%. And I hear that from many other automotive companies, interns, new hires, that they don't own a car, they don't want to drive. Um, a lot of people under 30 actually refuse to drive. They'd rather take an Uber. All the people, I know a guy here who just works across the street at Till Enough. He commutes from San Francisco down here every day, and he'd rather takes an Uber than drive himself because he can work while he's in the Uber. Now, there are three uh, trends, two technology trends, one more um, uh, business model trend, but of course there's AI included in, in at least two of them, uh, and that we are going to do a little bit deeper look. And one is autonomous driving, electric driving, and shared driving. Let's start with autonomous driving. So this is today a list of 57 companies that have a, have a license in uh, California, gotten by the California DMV, to test autonomous vehicles on public roads, 57. Together, they operate over a thousand vehicles. Uh, several hundred are in Silicon Valley, some are in uh, Arizona, some are in Nevada, some are in Pittsburgh, Boston, wherever they are testing that. But uh, you see here BMW, we know Volkswagen, we know your Tesla, uh, but Jingji Corporation, Zooks, Drive AI, Pony AI, who has heard of them? Yeah? And you should have heard of them because Zooks just raised in total $800 million uh, venture capital to do that. So since 2013, uh, there were $80 billion spent on the development of autonomous vehicles. So this is, this is not just something little going on, there's a lot going on here. 57 companies, this is the current status. I check every day, is a new company added to that. So the last new company that was two days ago, uh, I forgot the name because X Motors, X Motors, uh, Chinese subsidiary. So, how do you recognize them? So, for the Swiss guys and everyone who is visiting here, when you're traveling here, driving through this area, do not sit just in the bus checking your emails. Look out of the window. Be very mindful and attentive. Look out, and you can recognize those cars on these things sticking out. These are lidar sensors, laser detection sensors, radars ultrasounds, cameras, all these different things. These are all experimental cars, even trucks uh, here. We have a half a dozen companies that are working on the autonomous truck. Uh, so here's a video that I took from, you know, I, I keep, keep having my camera ready to shoot and at the moment because these cars are just around everywhere here, several things. So you see here these cars driving around the Mountain View on the highway, on the 101 up north to San Francisco. It's an older, older film that we have here. These cars had no steering wheel and no uh, brake pedals and gas pedals. They are now retired. They had 60 cars of them. This is a third, third generation car now. They are in generation 6 and 7 already. This is one in summer uh, during the daylight at the Google campus. This was in February last year. Uh, we didn't know what it is. Uh, a few, two months later, we knew it's Apple. So this was the first Apple uh, autonomous ve test vehicles that they had. Looks like Google, but it was not. Here, this is uh, Apple Maps. So in order for autonomous vehicles to operate, you need much more precise maps, HD maps that you have. So they're driving around, curb head in centimeters and so on. This is one of these shuttle buses from, also from France, from Toulouse. It's called Easy Mile operating at Bishop Ranch, this is the East Bay in this office park between the, the buildings. So there's also not, not even a, a seat for driver considered. This was Uber as long as they were operating. Yeah, you know, you've heard that they shut down this operation because of a feel fresh a few months ago. They are trying, I think, to renew that and, and do that again. Um, so here, different arrangements of cameras, sensors, and whatever. So you see a lot of, lot of different things. And then I saw one of those auto trucks that was then later acquired by Uber. Uh, and you see here sensor, here on top of the camera. And I apologize if I cannot, if you, the video is not good enough, but I was driving myself and I had to be careful. Or autonomous systems such as this in Redwood City, this cooling box on wheels is a delivery robot bringing your pizza from the pizza restaurant to your office. 
or here's security robot Nightscope, which is a Palo Alto company, driving around having, you see the LiDAR system, the LiDAR poke up there, uh, reading license plates, but also has a sensor to smell, for example, ammonium, which is, con which is part of our urine. So if somebody peed there that they should not pee, it can detect that. Without a, without a, in other words, autonomous systems are already here. They're just not equally distributed, right? Here you see uh, from 2016 a list of companies back then, several hundred companies that were developing uh, the different layers and pillars of autonomous vehicles from processors, sensors, connectivity, mapping, algorithms, security, safety, to development tools, or the whole stack of solutions. Today, these are several thousand companies. Uh, as I said, 80 billion since 2013 have been uh, invested into uh, the development of autonomous vehicles. Um, even if a few of them still a lot will be continuing. So this is a thing that is coming. There's no discussion. The question is more when exactly. Yeah? But be prepared that it's coming earlier than you think. Now you can use this technology also for other purposes. Darn, April 1st, we have to wait again until we can buy that, right? Well, it may, may sound uh, funny, or it may be a funny video, of course, but why not? And actually, um, one of my clients is Harley Davidson, Harley Davidson Milwaukee. You may have heard yesterday, they're opening an innovation center in Silicon Valley. Yes, yeah, so they're coming here, Harley Davidson is coming, opening a facility here. And you have to know that motorbikes, for example, 30% uh, of all fatal crashes with motorbikes are happening without the influence of somebody else. So these are basically riding errors that these people have. Now imagine you have this technology on the motorbike uh, and it detects and catches a riding error before it happens. This person lives on to tell the story. This is a look into the Google garage. Yeah? So if you are local, you will probably know where they are. Um, I took pictures back then. They did not have yet their their cover, their side cover in the invisibility cloak, so you could peek in and make pictures. That's what I did. So here you see the 60 vehicles that they had that are now retired. These were the first pictures of those new vehicles where they have 600 now. You see them that they don't even have yet the, li the LiDAR cap on there. So uh, since I took these pictures and published them, I'm a persona non grata on the Google campus over there. So, but that's the risk you have to take. And uh, you can, of course, also learn that. So if you if you have seen those signs at the 101 at Palo Alto North up ways here, yeah, northbound, you see Udacity. This is found, was founded by Sebastian Tran, the German. Yeah, Sebastian Tran, the very same person who was hired by Google to start the self-driving car program. Yeah, so the Waymo program came out of Sebastian Tran's group. And he was the winner of the DARPA Grand Challenge, the the challenge for autonomous vehicles back then in 2000 five or six, I think it was. Um, now, for 
venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, autonomous driving is basically solved, right? Uh, so when you come here as a visitor from abroad and look for the next trends and people will tell you autonomous cars, that's already a solved problem here. Yeah? It's just a distribution problem, getting it out to the people. So what's the next thing? Well, take a look just at the same sign right now. So when you go up today, back to San Francisco, flying cars are coming. Guess what? Sebastian Schwann is already basically moved away, moved out of that thing. So he's now in building with Kitty Hawk the flying car and has a class on that uh, online university. Well, let's take a look at the backgrounds of these new automotive pioneers. Yeah? So, so when we see Elon Musk, we had the CEO of Tesla. Uh, he's a physicist, but he did PayPal, as you know, so he's a very digital guy. Um, we have Sergey Brin, Larry Page, the Google founders, the computer scientist, Kylie Vogt, who founded Cruise Automation, that was acquired by General Motors for half a billion dollars. He's a roboticist. Sebastian Tran, here he is, computer scientist. He was also a professor at the AI lab in Stanford. Uh, these people here basically drive AI. They are all AI experts and computer scientists, basically out of his lab. Uh, and then Robin Lee from China, the founder uh, of Baidu, the, the, the basically the, the Chinese Google, is a computer scientist. What professions do we not see here? All the guys basically bending metals. Yeah? So every person that today you would hire at a car company, at a traditional car company. Yeah? That was the main thing. What, what kind of sign does that give you? That there is disruption going on. Yeah? These are people with completely new uh, fields and disciplines coming in and attacking a field with new technologies. Now let's take a look why this is the case. So this is it's a video of how a self-driving car sees the world. First, it has to figure out where am I, what's around me, and what actually is that? Yeah, is this a pedestrian, a bicyclist, a motorbike, a, a sign, a tree, a car? Is this a lane marker? Now suddenly there are traffic cones. What's valid? What's, what should I follow? The lane marker or the traffic cones? Yeah. Uh, there is a parked car. Can I pass by? There's a bicyclist. I have to pay attention to that guy. Oh, well, there's a car parked. Well, it's a police car. Oh, my God, it's active, this police car. Now, does it mean me or does it mean somebody else? Should I wait? Should I pass by? Yeah? What's the right context, the right behavior around the vehicle, like a school bus, which I cannot pass due to safety reasons, so that kids are dashing over the street and I'm not hitting them. Yeah? So these are all things to figure out. Now, one autonomous car typically creates between one to four terabyte of data per hour. So if you have a smartphone like this, yeah, uh, 256 gigabyte, that means one car per hour writes four to 16 smartphones full with data. Now, who can deal with that kind of amount of data and put algorithms around that and do that in, in real time, the decision, not five hours later, yeah, because the, the child is now passing over the street. The metal benders with those guys here, or oh, sorry, or those guys. Wrong button. Those guys with uh, those backgrounds. So I was in software business. Yeah, dealing with so much data is really a pain in the in the neck, so to speak. So they are the ones who are skilled to deal with that data. Yeah, moving the robot, the two-ton car, then around is because of those algorithms. Now where are we with that? So if you have looked. Tesla, uh, since October 2016, have been uh, building cars that come equipped with the Autopilot 2 hardware kit. And that includes eight cameras. So when you take a look at them, you see them here. There are three in here. There's one here at the side beam uh, with uh, radar, ultrasound, all this kind of stuff that other cars that have ADATs also have. But also they have graphic processing units in there. So they had up to now some NVIDIA chips in there to deal with these amounts of data. What's missing is the working software, right? They have the autopilot, which is nothing else than a level two, a little bit level three kind of uh, driving assist system, but we are working here on going to level four autonomy. And, but they are, they're having the pass literally in there. So what they're doing is they're actually already collecting data. So far, there are over 200,000 cars, Model S, Model X, Model 3, since October 2016 that have been manufactured with that equipment. Just imagine that 
you're a German automotive maker or you're General Motors, and somebody tells you, you know, let's put in several thousand dollars of equipment that does not work yet, don't tell anyone about it, yeah? And later, a year later, so two years later, we will turn it on. Would you get it uh, through the decision process? Never, right? Uh, but here, this is Elon Musk. He can, he can do that. He can get that through. So somewhere in the future, in the next few months or a year, we will probably see an update that suddenly gives you a much stronger uh, autonomous driving functionality than the regular hard autopilot that we are aware of. And suddenly you have 200,000 cars suddenly equipped, capable of uh, uh, autonomous driving uh, capabilities that nobody else has. And they're already collecting the data and basically sending the data, all the customer cars or the customers who have a key to that, sending the data back to the mothership that you know, puts it into the machine learning system and creates uh, those things. Now here's a thing that I wanted to show you. This is uh, one of the Waymo cars driving around and this is Mountain View downtown. I'm sitting in a cafe. This car screen is trying to move around the corner, made a right turn. Nothing spectacular, right? Uh, just a car making a right turn. But I wanted to notice something special, what this car is trying to do, and it gives a hint of where we're actually at the state of that thing. We are here at a crosswalk, an intersection, and this direction has green. So also the pedestrians have green. And the car tries to make a right turn. But it waits, it hesitates, it inches a little bit forward, stops again, inches again forward, stops, and then it moves on. Because, why? There are two women standing uh, where it looks at the intent. The car tries to figure out what's the intent of these two pedestrians. Are they going to cross the street or not? So, how does it recognize intent? By looking at the face. Where's the face directed? at? Yeah? Does it look at me? That means the face looking, facing at the car with the cameras, uh, or is it just looking somewhere else? And that means no intent to cross the street. So these two women are talking, and we notice that they're not having an intent to walk over. It's very difficult for the car, so that is what the car tries to do. Let's let's look again at it. So these are the women. Here, this woman looks at the car, but she actually looks at the other woman. Yeah, and the car doesn't know. Does it mean me? Does it mean her? So it inches forward and now finally makes a decision to go ahead. So this is AI in action, so to speak, uh, controlling a two-ton robot. Um, and that is, uh, we, are, we are way beyond the fact to recognize lane markers and objects. What we are trying to figure out now is, what is the intent of this object? Yeah? And what is my reaction to that? And that is something that you see when you look carefully. Now, Another status update is we don't really know how far each of those companies is. We have only hunches. And the best guess that we have comes from the data uh, that these companies have to uh, submit every year to the California DMV because that's where they get a license to run those autonomous vehicles. And that's called a disengagement report. The last one was submitted in November, end of November last year. Uh, they do it annually. And 14 companies, uh, reported and only those companies really had done testing here uh, while they were here. Now this engagement is when the computer basically blacks out, doesn't know how, what to do now, and hands over control to the safety driver behind the wheel. And that's they call it disengagement. Um, now how far are we? On average, a Waymo car has one disengagement every 9,000 kilometers driven. So every 5,800 miles driven. So if you are a regular driver driving average 12,000, 15,000 kilometers, uh, that means a Waymo car hands over control every seven to nine months once. That's when it doesn't know. So GM Cruise uh, is at a self-reported stage of 2,000. Yeah, so we can discuss how accurate those numbers are, but this is the best what we have. And then we see here Bosch Mercedes. Mercedes was actually the pioneer of self-driving in the 1900, late 1980s, early 1990s. They did extensive self-driving uh, uh, development. They did, for example, uh, Stockholm, Paris, on highways in city, you know, with their cars full with server racks and cameras, clunky stuff. So 
basically the hardware and technology was not ready that, but they had an impressive success back then with that. Now they have disengagement rates of every two kilometers, every 1.27 mile the, the computer hands back. And we're talking here about Waymo, which drives mostly in cities, yeah? Uh, not on highway, highway is much easier, yeah? But which drives mostly. So that is kind of that stage. Even if you say, well, well, uh, this is probably 10 times as worse, yeah? And they may be 100 times as good, yeah? But they just don't tell us, yeah? It's still 900 versus 200, yeah? So, and because this is machine learning, this is software, we're talking here about an exponential learning curve. Uh, with 600 cars versus a few dozen cars on the road, on the test tracks versus 600 cars on the road, there's a much faster machine learning process going on. So that's autonomous driving. Let's move to electric driving, Model 3. So if you're paying attention uh, from Switzerland, our guests, yeah, you will see them driving around here. Yeah? Alone in the last two months, they already produced again 34,000 cars uh, or July, uh, or August. Yeah? Even with all the, they're fifth now in, in the US in sales statistics of all cars. Uh, so with all the production problems that you may hear in Germany and in Europe uh, reporting. Now, this is an eight-cylinder uh, machine car. An engine has, an eight-cylinder engine has 1,200 components with transmission, exhaust pipes, uh, gasoline, uh, all this kind of stuff. You have 2,000 components. Tesla, the electric motor, has 17 components, one seven, a hundredth of that. So now you have to think about that. Behind each component part is an engineer who designed it, an engineer who does quality assurance, an engineer who you know, stocks it in the inventory, who, who tests it, who, who repairs it. So there's a whole uh, tail of people working on those components. And then you have only one that's 17 components. And not much to maintain here. It's an electric motor, yeah? for Christ's sake. Uh, you don't have oil to change. You don't have uh, oil filters to change, a spark plug to change. So maintenance is much lower than, uh, than the rest. Also, battery prices, we see here a projection back then, starting 2005, of the, the, the battery prices in kilowatt hours, so how much cost a kilowatt hour, uh, and projections till 2030. Tesla was already in 2016 at the sweet spot of 150, where it com becomes competitive with uh, combustion car, fuel efficiency, uh, fuel prices. But now, uh, they apparently had a breakthrough because Elon Musk mentioned that their kilowatt hour price is $100, which is a huge advantage to everyone else uh, who is working in that field. Uh, now, where do you put the charging stations? Anywhere, yeah? anywhere where you like, at your home, uh, in front of IKEA, in front of a cafe, cof favorite coffee, yeah? you charge for free. Do that with a gas station. You can't put a gas station any place you like because it's poisonous, yeah? they are poisonous liquids, so you have to get some you know, certain places only. Also, a gas station, a regular gas station, costs a half a million dollars upwards. Fuel cell gas stations cost one and a half million dollars and upwards, while just some, some uh, charging stations, when everything is prepared, cost three to seven thousand five, three thousand to seven thousand five hundred dollars. Yeah, and you're not actually going to those places because you charge mostly at home. If you have a house with the thing or a garage place with that, or you charge at work, right? So. You're never going to the gas station. Now, just think of that. Gas stations, 50% of all cigarette sales are happening at gas stations. Not that I'm sad that cigarette sales will go down when there are no gas stations, but just think about it. Red Bull, by the way, Red Bull energy drinks, 50% of the, of the Red Bull sales are also at the gas station. Uh, now, here an interesting fact that shows you also the craziness of evaluations and of uh, the Silicon Valley a bit here. Yeah? Um, on June 8, 2007, uh, Tesla was the first time more worth than uh, BMW. It was already a long time worth more than General Motors, more worth than Ford. But look at the numbers. Yeah? How many vehicles did they sell in 2016? 18,000 versus 2 million, 10 million, 6.6 .6 million. And then look at the profit, minus $700 million. Six thousand nine, uh, six billion dollars, almost seven billion dollars, nine billion dollars, four point six billion dollars. So they make all shitloads of money, sell shitloads of cars, but they are less worth than Tesla, this mini manufacturer. Um, so what is the story here? Yeah. 
Well, this is, uh, is, the, is, the, is the share price a reflection of the success of a company? It's actually a bet. A bet of the shareholders on the future of that company, right? So we call it the innovation premium. You may remember Steve Jobs when he was ousted from Apple and Scully, the Pepsi guy, took over. Yeah? And then Steve Jobs came back. The innovation premium of Apple was minus 39%. Basically, shareholders had given up on that company. They didn't see a future for them. They didn't see products coming out for them. A few years after Steve Jobs took over, the innovation premium, that means the share price in comparison to the revenue, was plus almost 90%. Uh, and that is what we see here. They see Tesla as being much better equipped and positioned to conquer the future. So Tesla actually makes uh, has a huge profit margin on selling the cars. Yeah? This is even more than, than Daimler has on each car. But they're taking all this money and even more, that's in order to build the gigafactory, zzz, big gigafactories, yeah, now multiple of them, uh, to do the uh, supercharger network, to uh, do new lines, to do solar city and all these power walls, all this kind of stuff. And that means they are putting down the chess figures on the board in a way that the others are not doing. General Motors actually has, in the last years, spent over $16 billion to buy back shares. $16 billion. Instead of investing that into innovation, they did to buy back shares to propel the share price up so that on the short, short term, you get better bonuses as management. Right? That is what is happening here. Uh, now we talk about a little in the electric vehicle sector about Tesla, but let's not forget the leader is China. We have here over three dozen companies that build electric vehicles today. Some of them actually are here in the neighborhood. Yeah, Neo is uh, not far from here. We have um, uh, Far Right Future down in the south. Yeah, Lucid Motors is up here in the East Bay now. They're in Fremont, close to Tesla. But I wanted to show you a video in order just to, to give you an impression of how much power is behind that. That's the delivery of several hundred electric buses to the city of Shenzhen. For those of you who don't know much about China, I'm one who doesn't know much. Uh, Shenzhen is the sister city of Hong Kong, where basically the electronic manufacturing of the world happens. So when you have an iPhone, it's been produced there. And Shenzhen has 16,400 diesel buses. Well, they had because they replaced them all within two years. In December 2007, 2017, so last year, December, they delivered the last batch of electric buses. So they have 16,400 electric buses now operating in the city. In between, you see all these little cars. These are electric taxis. They are also replacing that. Beijing has 70,000 combustion taxis, and they are replacing all of them in the next years with electric taxis. Uh, in the world, we have around 395,000 electric buses like these operating. I'm not talking about trolley buses with cables going up, but like these, uh, of which 99% operate in China. Just this week, we reached 4 million electric passenger vehicles worldwide. The first million took five years. The second million took 17 months. The third million took 10 months. The fourth million took six months, and now we expect the next million, the fifth million cars, passenger cars sold in March next year. So this is an exponential curve that we see here coming up. So China is definitely the leader. Don't believe any German car company telling you uh, that they are leading in electric vehicle technology. You need to have those cars on the road in order to improve them and become better. Uh, in the first electric vehicle, pure electric vehicle of a German manufacturer. Okay, that's the i3. But in the class of a Tesla uh, is the Mercedes EQC, and that comes out later next year. So, um, so what's the future of the combustion engine? The dinosaur model. Yeah? Dinosaur juice is going away, so to speak. <laughs> so let's go to the, the shared vehicles. And shared vehicles, uh, we have been talking here about basically the Ubers, the different models of sharing from transportation network provider to uh, where you have club membership in car company, in, in, in zip cars and so on. So we have here a company from Germany that's called MyTaxi. 
Europeans may know that, yeah. It was a very successful German startup founded in the first half of 2009, and they raised over the next four years 40 million euro. And then they were acquired by Daimler. And since then, they have been expanding. You find them in Madrid, in Vienna, in Berlin, everywhere, yeah. And it's basically an app where you can hail a taxi. So for taxi, that's an additional channel to get customers, right? In the same uh, first half of 2009, there was another company being founded, and it was Uber in San Francisco. This company has raised so far $16 billion, 400 times the amount of my taxi, uh, and is, according to different analysts, worth between 58 to $72 billion. Yeah? You know, with all the troubles that we've heard in the, in the last month, but while my taxi is working with taxis, so within the regulations, and they're getting a lot of shit hit at them from the taxis, uh, Uber is questioning this model, yeah, and bringing not taxis, but private cars in. So I give, an, I give an example of a friend of mine who is from Spain, she works in Germany at SAP, uh, is on a conference in Las Vegas, and six in the morning she's on the way to drive to the airport in a taxi. So they stopped at a red light, a police officer comes, knocks at the window, says, okay, so where are you going? Yeah, well, we're going to the airport. So the airport is in the other direction, right? Uh, well, it's so much traffic, uh, uh, I try to uh, avoid that. It's six in the morning, there's no traffic. You turn around right now and go the darkest way, the closest, shortest way down to the airport. Uh, then he knocks at her window, gives her his card, telephone number, call me if you have troubles. This cannot cost more than $20. What happened here? He tried to make a detour, right, to milk you because you're a foreigner, you don't know nothing about Las Vegas. Yeah? Like you are here in San Francisco, in San Jose, no? you don't know the path. They could do a detour. Yeah? Uh, with Uber, how does Uber work? Well, I open the app, the app knows where I am, I enter the destination, and it gives me a price. The Uber driver does not get more money if he or she does a detour. They get only more money the faster they bring me to my destination. So technology changes those regulations that were introduced by cities and communities to avoid taxi companies taking advantage of you. Yeah? And that's been a problem for thousands of years, actually, because in old Rome, there were laws about the <laughs> horse carriages that did that thing to you back then. So those three disruptions are coming at the same time, basically. One of them is already tough enough, but all three at the same time changes everything. So this is uh, an, an, an engine factory in Austria, 4,100 employees. They're building all the BMW engines and the mini engines. Now, where's the engine, right? Now, it's not the baby uh, propelling the car. It's not child labor that we have here, but where's the engine? What will happen to those guys in the next five to 10 years? 4,100 employees. There's no job for them, right? So when we actually look at the numbers, a third of all people in the automotive industry are working on the engine and all supporting components. So when you look at Volkswagen, these are like 200,000 out of 600,000 people. Uh, and there's no overlap really in, you know, you need 10% of those 200,000 for electric vehicle manufacturing. Uh, so there's no overlap because if you are uh, responsible for bending some metals, you're not a battery chemist suddenly, yeah, or programming autonomous vehicles. And this leads to quite some disruption there. And then now you understand also why they're clinging so much to the diesel uh, and why they are afraid of being frank in their statements. Yeah? So that, that's an industry that's going to go down in some parts. Yeah? So how will it look like now? When we look at the power, for example, through not digital companies, these are the five most valuable companies in the US. They're all on the West Coast. They're worth, and I look it up today because yesterday Amazon crashed to the trillion dollar barrier yeah, evaluation. So uh, you, have, you have now two Apple and, and Amazon uh, a trillion dollars worth. They are worth together $4.2 trillion. Now compare that to the DAX, 30 companies in the German stock index. Uh, they are worth $1.4 trillion. Uh, the most valuable company here is SAP, $145 million. Basically, the cheapest company is Facebook with around $500 plus billion. Yeah? Those companies are all younger than 45 years. Three actually are younger than 25. 
years, while here 24 out of 100 companies, at the, uh, 24 out of 30 companies in the DAX are older than 100 years. Yeah, great German companies survive. Holy shit, we're not getting new companies up there. Now we already Germans already or Europe already lost kind of the digital world, and now comes AI, the AI story here, and digital broadband internet. GDPR, all these kind of things, a basic, build, uh, basic building blocks for AI. And this is something where China and uh, the US are dominating and will dominate, and where Europe is already out of the game without knowing that. So what jobs are will be going away or diminished? Truck drivers, of course. Who needs them yeah? when the car drives alone? Taxi drivers. Uh, we estimate up to 50, uh, up to 90 percent, some say 100 percent cheaper taxi costs. So you will basically take a taxi for free. 70 percent fewer jobs or ch fewer work for for mechanics. Uh, insurance rates, cars are then driving 80, 90 percent and more safer than human drivers. So that means the insurance will go go down. Today you pay in Germany for every car per year 50 to 60 euro. Uh, so like $70 in traffic fines, but autonomous cars are not violating the rules, they're not parking wrong, right? So th there goes no money. And then traffic lights, yeah, the cost between 35,000 and 250,000 euro. Germany alone has 3 million of them, but who needs traffic lights? Humans, right? So let's take a look at the video. So I think I would crap my pants sitting in a car driving such a traffic. Yeah? So I'm not sure if you want to have that really. <laughs> uh, for every car, uh, we have four parking spaces. A parking space costs between 20 and 30,000 euro. So you base it dollars. So you, if you tell it up, you realize that the parking spaces are worth more than all the cars on the road. Um, signs, they cost between 80 to 200 Germany alone is 20 million of them. We don't need them. Uh, public transport in, in San Francisco, for example, women, most women are only using Uber as a, as, a, as, a, as a transportation because it's safer, because data is created in you. Now tell that the European who lives under the GDPR, where they're all afraid of privacy and data. Here's data used for making you safer. Yeah? Uh, and that's why we have to think about what's happening to public transport. Yeah? And uh, should public transport companies become the next Uber operators or the next operators of autonomous vehicles? Uh, so these are a couple of these professions that are being affected of disappearing or tuned down. But with every disruption, there are coming new jobs. For example, with the cars came roads that we needed for that. So all these things about road maintenance, road construction, road administration, road fees, etc. But also, uh, second order, third order changes that we could not predict. Suddenly, shopping malls. Yeah, shopping malls are on the outside of the cities. How do you get there with a the coach? Not at all, right? With a car, no problem. So shopping malls, the targets, the WalMarts exist only because of the car. How is the timeline the, to, to the robotaxi, the electric robotaxi, driving assist systems we have already today? We have uh, a dozen taxi fleets operating already with passengers in experimental mode in several cities and several continents. And from then this year, next year, Tesla Model 3 mass rollout. Basically, this is happening right now under our eyes because it's 10 minutes from here is the factory. We know that. Uh, this is how the car looks like. So just a touchscreen. Steering wheel, brake pedals, that's it. This is here a BMW 3, a, a Audi, uh, sorry, a Mercedes uh, C-Class. How does it look like? Basically, like an old steam engine in a museum, right? With the big levers and the valves and the gauges. Looks cool, I'm from a train family, I love that, but I would not daily commute with such a thing, yeah? I look at it in a museum. Now the i3 is kind of in between electric vehicle, but then, General Motors introduced this car, is going to introduce this car next week. That's a Chevrolet Bolt without a steering wheel. Yeah? So basically, their General Motors cruise cars that are being tested today on Chevrolet Bolts will be then switching to those cars. Uh, and somebody went ahead and took a Tesla Model 3 and photoshopped it. So how does that look like? What does it tell you? The Model 3 is already designed 
as a self-driving car. Yeah? While those guys are still fascinated with all these gauges and steampunk kind of uh, uh, contraptions in their car. Uh, highway auto autonomous driving that will come, we already have commercial freights uh, operating on autonomous vehicles on highways, you know, Long Beach to El Paso, Google is doing that, bring it to service centers. Several hundred thousand Teslas will get a software update to drive autonomously. Uh, and then, maybe the biggest hit will be then uh, Waymo, the Google sister, they uh, ordered 20,000 uh, Jaguars and 62,000 Fiat Chrysler minivans, the cars that we've seen, uh, for the deployment in the next month, within the next two or three years. Uh, 82,000 cars running not for tests anymore, running for full operation and deployment. Just to give a number, New York has 43,000 taxis. Uh, the US overall has 240 something thousand taxis. Now Waymo is coming and just putting 82,000 robot taxis on the street. That gives you an idea why, comp why analyst companies are not evaluating Waymo alone with $175 billion of value with them having not a single dollar of revenue yet. So that's uh, coming then soon. Other companies will follow. The electric vehicles will become cheaper than combustion engine. It becomes basically uh, um, not economically to operate and buy a, a combustion engine car. In 2025, we will see then that insurance rates for humans will be 10 times as high as for autonomous vehicles. And during a disruption, normally 50 to 90% of all companies that owned the market before are gone. Uh, just to remember, I'll give you an example. Uh, just uh, think about 10 years ago, which phone brand did you have? Nokia, right? Blackberry, Samsung, uh, Sony, yeah. Ericsson, Motorola, right? Siemens, uh, things like that. How many of them are still here doing smartphones? Samsung, one. So that gives you a sign. Uh, and they will be lucky, actually, if they get acquired by somebody, yeah? becoming their manufacturer. Uh, the majority of vehicles in 2030 are electric robotaxis. The last person makes a driver license. And actually, manual driving will be outlawed on public roads. Now you can discuss. 2030, is it 2033, is it 2035? Uh, it's, not, it's not the question. The question is when it will come. Yes, that's the clear answer. And it comes faster than you think. Uh, what comes after that? Flying cars. I put it in as a joke. Turns out three dozen companies doing that. Yeah? Uh, so what do I know about flying cars? Nothing. So remember 1900, 1913. Within 13 years, it happened, the flip. We are now 2018, I talk about the 2030 framework time, yeah? It's 13 years, 12 years, 13 years. The speed of innovation is faster than of adoption. It took 75 years for the phone to reach 100 million users, but only 16 years for the mobile phone. Facebook, four and a half years. Pokemon Go, two weeks. There's even, not even, I couldn't even put, put the thing in there. Um, let's jump over that. Uh, let's go to the... So, so for those of you working in such traditional companies, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. Yeah? If you're waiting until somebody allows you that, you're dying. Yeah? Uh, your skeleton. So if you want to know more, I have, if you speak German right now, there's this book. You can get it in any bookstore or, or, or Amazon. There's also a website, two websites, one in English, one in German, it's called the last driver license holder.com, the letzte Führerschein Neuling.com, where I keep that updated, where I get the newest information, sightings of new autonomous vehicles that we don't know. Yeah. So take a look at them. Um, these are the books. This book, as I said, comes out summer next year in English and in actually Chinese Mandarin. Mandarin. We have uh, a Mandarin version too. Uh, and I just want to leave you with the sentence Elon Musk. He said, I'm just trying to think about the future and not be sad. How am I leaving the planet back? Basically, what, what, how can I leave it better back than I found it? And here's a, a video just to lighten up the mood.
Here we go. Thank you very much. Uh, up the questions. Uh, since we only have really one good working mic, uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. We'll do it row, one row at a time. Mario, you can repeat the question for the audience. Okay. So this row here, this row. Question. Anyone with a question? Okay, yeah. Any questions? Questions? You have a question? Come here, come here, come here, come to me. No. Thank you. Uh, from a, from a, can I, hello, there we go. Okay, from a technical standpoint, what kind of problems are they facing like right now? For example, if there's mud and it covers the, the, the camera, or if there's snow or rain, uh, I'm, I'm assuming does LiDAR have a real bad issue with that? Right. Yeah. So, so good, good question. What happens on the weather conditions that are less favorable for the sensors? Uh, so currently, those, most of those cars uh, that we see are driving in very favorable conditions here in the Bay Area with always sun most of the time. Uh, Chandler, Arizona, where it's always sunny. So, but there are also challenges there because sun can be blinding a camera. Now, for certain conditions, like snow, uh, certain sensors have troubles with that, with certain conditions, for example, lighters are getting basically reflected by the snow flakes. So you have to develop algorithms and more sensitive or combine that. That means sensor fusion, uh, that you have other sensors taking over. Cameras may be blinded. Yeah, they have some lag when you go from very dark into uh, bright light and so on. Then you have radar. There are different effects that are happening. Uh, what we see is that on the one side, all these sensors are being developed to include more and more features, uh, becoming smaller and smaller, becoming more, less and less expensive. So you can put more of those sensors actually on the car. And then they are developing algorithms in order to be independent from certain um, infrastructure on the road or markers on the road just to use you know GPS navigation uh, with high precision data to have underground radar when you snow cover the road uh, all these kind of things is is what it's not perfect this this is there's still tons to do that's why those cars are driving in Pittsburgh or in Boston where the less favorable conditions are in Kirkland where it's always rainy um, or in uh, uh, Ford in the Detroit area has a lot of snow, so these are the conditions that everyone is testing. The question is more like how do those companies share these experiences, developments, because there's currently not really anything going on like that. The, the regulators are not um, having, I think, currently a framework in place. Uh, the regulators, government, should be interested in having all of those cars be safe to protect all of us, yeah, and not one fleet being better than the other and the other one hitting all these people and the other not. So, so here's a lot of work to do, not just in technology development, but also in, in collaboration, forced cooperation and data exchange standards and regulations uh, from multiple levels. Other question? So a bit of a complicated question. Um, it has to do with the fact that in the sort of 50s, I guess, really, we had an acceleration of people acquiring cars in the first place. And then there was a, a hollowing out of the cities because people wanted to move in the suburbs and have their own house. And as a result, we had urban decay. Um, has there been any consideration of how autonomous cars really are going to damage the overall quality of life for people and also cause people to start moving further and further out and building suburbs out by you know, Shasta and spending all their time in their cars, of course, sleeping and eating and all kinds of things. Just one little aside, one of the great things about autonomous cars is that people will be able to be a solution for homelessness. People will be able to have this module which could just push a button that goes up to a bathroom, you know, you're done, you have very low cost. For, but 
The real question here is, I've been the leading advocate for making vehicles mechanically coupled to each other and form trains on the road. And that's particularly useful when you've got buses. When your bus modules make stops, but the main line runs continuously, you make your transfers on board, and then at rush hour, the bus becomes much faster than driving a car, at least in the congestion conditions. Has there been much consideration that you've heard about building road trains? The only person I know of who's actually doing this is the guy who I trained, Tommaso Gekulin, Next Future Transportation. And he's got an incubator in Dubai, and he's building his modules, bus modules. Actually got some physical prototypes. But in terms of the big companies, is there anybody really, is anybody hearing, you know, we should do road train buses, and we should do those first before we do even personal cars, because when the cars go autonomous and people cannot drive, they're going to be driving a lot more, and even though they, even if they use less fuel, we'll be using more fuel, and we'll have all these, all these negative impacts. So in order to have walkable, high-density cities, go to the buses first and build the connected bus trains. And is anybody talking about it in the environment you're talking about, your, your work? Well, thank you for the question. These are actually multiple questions that you have. Uh, first one is more the societal impacts. What does it mean to our cities? Uh, in, I would not use the word, uh, there's only damage, there's actually a lot of good. We have today, let's start autonomous vehicles, uh, of the damage that manual drivers do today. We have in the US uh, more cars than licensed drivers. Uh, in Germany, we have 45 million cars on the road. Uh, China is now basically ramping up massively. Uh, we have four parking spaces per, on average, over the US, over Germany, for every car here. When you look here, just outside here, yeah, we have four lane regular streets. But they are not pedestrian friendly. They are used for cars that are not driving there. Those cars are tw over 23 hours parking. The German word for Vehicle is Fahrzeug, which means literally the driving thingy. It's not a driving thingy, it's a standing thingy. Yeah? It's standing around for over 23 hours every day on average, a car. So we have a lot of resources there. Now, it turns out when you do simulations, Lissabon, you need only 10 or 12% of today's 200,000 cars that are operating there, and you could still cover basically with autonomous cars uh, as a robot taxi service, uh, all almost 99, almost 99 percent of the miles that people drive. Uh, Singapore, where they did another simulation, needs uh, because of the situation of Singapore, you have to need 30 percent car in order to cover that. So today's cities are sprawling also because of traffic, of because of uh, parking spaces. That you just look at San Francisco, you need every parking space. Every basically house has a driveway in there to parking spaces, which is not used. Um, you have cars parked on the road. Uh, that is massive land use that we would get would free up if we reduce the numbers, let's say, to 10 or 20 percent of today's car population uh, that are used in a shared a shared system. And suddenly we give back the streets to humans. When you look at pictures from 100 years ago of the road conditions there, you had dogs laying in the middle of a road. You had children playing games in the middle of a road. Today, you would think it's crazy, a child running in the middle of this four-lane road over there. Yeah? It's, it's, it's suicidal or the parents are nuts doing that. Um, so it, it, autonomous car, uh, human drivers today kill in the US 40,000 people every year. 1.2 million people get injured. Worldwide, we have over 12 million people who are getting injured and over 1 million people dying in car accidents. 94% of those fatalities of these accidents are happening due to human error. Because we're tired, because we're not paying attention completely, we don't have a 360 degree view. Some people are under and the drug influence, some people are road raging, yeah, uh, all these things are happening. Uh, and we have actually uh, a, an increasing number of fatalities because, because of that. Yeah? People are looking at that all the time. So we could save here quite a number of people through autonomous cars. Now, not everything is rosy and shiny with that because what's happening now is you could say, and we don't know that if this is going to happen, well, if I'm just sitting in the car and can watch a movie, I'm commuting two hours or three in one direction and do that stuff. Yeah? Uh, so that means, do we live farther out there than today? 
Probably. I don't, we don't know yet. Yeah? Can we do regulations? Can we predict that? Can we do something against it? We'll have to see. It may be that we have today's downtown, today's cities, more livable because of removing cars from there, the majority of the cars. We have today actually, uh, in the US, 80% of the people live in urban areas. In Japan, it's actually 90%. Germany also is 76%. Uh, Austria is 66%, and I think Switzerland is in the same direction of 66% of the people living in urban areas. Um, urban is something that a lot of people move into because there are more options for them. They feel, uh, you know, you may say, yeah, living on the countryside is beautiful, but in the end, uh, you are, if you're working in certain professions, you want to be creative, the creative class, you live there. Now, public transport. I mentioned already it may replace certain parts of public transport. So we have a lot, number of cities already in the U.S. who are strongly considering or thinking hard about building a light rail or a subway station, a subway line, because construction takes, you know, 10 years. Then they're opening with big celebrations and the autonomous cars are there and nobody's using a subway anymore. So should we build that still? Uh, we have to look at the throughput that public transport systems can do. Yeah? Europe has a very, very good uh, public transport network, uh, especially Switzerland. Uh, so, uh, but it's a very expensive network, and it's not individual. You still have to the last mile problem that you have to go a mile or two to your home from the station. Um, so there are a lot of these second and third order changes that we cannot yet really predict. It could be as you say, that people are moving out two or three hours from here, that we have urban sprawl, even more happening. But we don't know for sure. It could be the opposite, that people are actually moving back into cities because the cities are now removed and car-free and more livable and giving you this experience of a more country feeling than before. Road, you mentioned road trains. Uh, well, I know about uh, road trains for, not for buses, but for 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 truck platooning, Volvo Scania doing that. We had a year ago here a presentation by a professor from a Swedish university who's doing a sabbatical in Berkeley who is uh, working with those companies on road trains and he basically told us all the challenges that we have here. Road train, uh, if for those of you who don't know that, it's basically you have trucks or buses or cars driving behind each other, like, like bicyclists here yeah, who save energy by having being in the shadow of the wind direction. Yeah. Uh, that's the same. So you can save fuel costs, a lot of things, and you basically work as one thing. The problem with that is um, it would require that all these trucks, all these cars, all these buses have the same horsepower or the same force, are driving the same speed, and that you have no change in road conditions. That means going up the hill, that trucks are not... Some are loaded, some are not loaded, yeah? all these kind of things happening, which makes it a bigger challenge. Cars who want to move out have to pass through those road trains. Road trains would have to open that up. That is actually the behavior that they've seen that challenges creating road trains today already. So how this works out, we don't know. Um, there are a lot of interesting things going on, but there are second and third changes that we just cannot predict. Sputnik. Sputnik created Tinder. Yeah? In the 50s, in the 60s, nobody could predict that the Sputnik, a satellite that the Russians shot up, will basically lead to third order change of having Tinder, a dating app. Yeah? Why Tinder? Why do I need this well, a relationship with them? GPS, positioning. Yeah? Fine, I'm matching up with a girl in Brazil. I'm here in San Jose. What the fuck? Yeah? I want to meet her, I'm not going to Brazil. So I want to, I need GPS, I need location. And that's the sport. So these are, these are changes that we cannot predict today in 10 years. Or the first, when you remember just 10 years ago, the first things that they showed on the phones, on the phones, Steve Jobs in the auditorium, he was reading the New York Times, yeah? he was doing a phone call, he was looking at pictures. What are we doing today with those machines? Calling an Uber, yeah? uh, doing Tinder. That was unpredictable back then. Thank you. Next question. Mostly autonomous driving is a software problem. How much uh, is that shared between those many companies you've shown uh, on your slides? 
So you mean the software development and data, how much is shared? So there are a number of companies that do their own stuff, yeah, the Waymos, the Ubers, they're not sharing data. There are some companies that buy each other's technology. They sh don't share data, no, no, they don't share data. No, they don't share data. Uh, so then there are companies who are working together, like the smaller startups, yeah, so AutoX, uh, Copernicus Auto, ships, uh, where they're working, and then we have open source systems where the nature is to share not only the data, but also the software and the training tools and so on. So we have, for example, Apollo from Baidu. Baidu, the Chinese company, uh, created an autonomous open source system. They are putting out a lot of data, sharing 150 partners and so on. But uh, in order to share driving data, real driving data with safety improvements and algorithms, we need uh, certainly regulators step in to make sure that the overall population benefits and not just one automaker. Next question. Fascinating discussion of the autonomous vehicle. All of the autonomy, or will there also be additional systems to support that, such as smart cities, smart roadways, to play in? So the question is, uh, do the cars need something on the infrastructure in order to... So let me give you here... I posed a question to a couple of these autonomous vehicle makers, and they all said, well, where do we have today a smart city? Where do we have today this infrastructure? We don't. So we develop cars that are independent from those things, uh, because we cannot wait for that. And if you wait, we will lose, uh, and there's no standard, and cities typically have no money for doing that, those kind of things. There's no standard around that, or maybe there is a standard, but nothing is done yet, and it takes typically with bureaucracies very long. So that is, that is the situation here. Very different when you talk to German car makers, or European car makers, because they, really, they just have to do something, so they put some signs and stuff on certain highways, and then I think one road in Berlin has something. Um, but this is already a lot of effort to do that for them. Yeah? And they are using that, they're telling us that uh, not so much because they think they really need it, but they, it's more kind of an excuse. It's far because, you know, it's not our fault. We need that kind of stuff. The communication providers tell us that we need for autonomous driving 5G connection and all this kind of data that we generate, you know, one to four terabyte per hour per car, etc. But this is not all going through this thing. Most of that is just staying in the car. Yeah. Um, so. The telecom providers are telling you that because they want to grab public money to build the infrastructure. So the whole narrative in Germany, for example, is we need this and this and this, and then we can build this because but it's not here. It's, uh, we cannot build this. And so, well, sorry, yeah, we would like to, but we can't because those players are not, and the government is not spending money on that. And that's why they are very much back yeah, and losing in that, in that space. Um, when you look now at uh, those companies here, they're not considering that. They're they they basically developing it without that. And I guess we will not rely on any road infrastructure except lane markers and this kind of stuff that we have today already to make autonomy possible. That will be later coming maybe as a nice feature for other stuff, but I don't think that... I think this is a dead horse that we're riding here. Yeah? So when you're in the connected car space, so for road infrastructure that talks to the car, maybe not the right business to be in. How are these great, beautiful companies, BMW and Mercedes, how are they planning for this death spiral? Denial. <laughs> Uh, so, so I've uh, I've been to to their places, and so the thing is, if I'm talking to somebody from BMW or from Daimler or a beer, yeah, they tell me, yeah, a friend, my my my, my brother-in-law is working for ZF. ZF is the company that makes transmissions, yeah, uh, and he realized, hello, electric vehicles don't need transmissions, right? So, what's my what's my job in the future? So he got retraining, yeah, he got retrained. We skilled. Uh, so individually, the people are very smart. They, they all know that when I ask in the audience who drove an elect who has driven an electric car, everyone raises the hand of this automotive maker. It doesn't matter Porsche, BMW, AAA, 
yeah, uh, suppliers. I've been asked them, do you think electric cars are the future? Except Porsche. And said yes, uh, the rest of it was 100%. Yeah? So I said, why am I standing here? Autonomous vehicle is the same. Yeah, of course it's coming and it will be coming, but they always think, no, nah, it's uh, 20 years, it's uh, not, not in the next five or 10 years, it's 20 years or 30 years, it's too difficult. I call it the reverse Moore's law. I give you, uh, I skip that slide, but, but maybe that makes a sense to give you an understanding of the Germans. Um, So, so here you have, here you have uh, Moore's law. You know that you know that says every 18 months the number of transistors on the computer chip uh, doubles, so the SO speed doubles, right? Uh, and that is a logarithmic scale, so it's a it's a, it's a it's a straight line. And you know, uh, it happened. It really it really went like this. Uh, and they called it Moore's law because Moore found out about that relationship. And Moore said, no, it's not a law, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. People look at that and said, if we're not you know, putting fire in there, we are losing out, so we have to plan in that direction. Yeah? And so everyone worked like that, and that spilled over, not just from the computer industry, but in other industries, like automotive industry, soft industry, to China, even to other countries. Yeah? Uh, because when you're driving here around, I've seen now, several self-driving cars from different companies at the same intersection, yeah? and they're seeing each other, yeah? they're looking at each other, and the drivers are moving between those companies, actually. Yeah? So they say, well, I've seen that car doing that turn, that U-turn, we cannot do that. Oh, we cannot, we have to do that. Yeah? Or did you see this new sensor sticking out there? Oh, we have to do that too. So basically, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. This is Moore laws, they're operating by the Moore's law. Now the Germans, when you go to them, they will tell you, ah, Electric vehicles, there are no charging stations, right? And I mean electric vehicles, it makes no engine noise, there's nothing like there. And you know this lithium comes off from these bad, 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 bad countries. We better not do that, yeah? Uh, we, I love my, my gasoline car. Autonomous vehicles, it's way too difficult and so complex and basically nobody wants to be driven, they want self, you know, joy of driving. That's even the motto of BMW, right? So you have their self-selecting process that is German car companies. Who goes to a car company? Who goes to Harley Davidson? To Harley Davidson you go because of blah, 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 blah. you love these machines with this noise. You're not going to buy the bill an electric scooter, right? You're not going to BMW or Daimler to to be driven around. You love driving. So those people working there cannot imagine that there are people outside that don't love driving or that there are people that today do not have access to individual mobility. Elderly kids, yeah, people living far abroad. Basically what they're building today is these are 30 to 50 year old men building cars for 30 to 50 year old men. That's it what we have today. Uh, so in the, that means they're operating by reverse Moore's law which uh, is the opposite of that. They're not ambitious, they're unambitious. And tell us, find all the reasons why this cannot work, why this will nothing be. So, so basically, the best engineers in the world, the German engineers, yeah, I'm a German-speaking engineer, uh, tell us all the reasons, spend all their energy, why this cannot work. Yeah, instead of focusing on how can we make it work. Logarithmical. So it's not linear, it's logarithmical, that means uh, it, the, the longer it takes, the less and less likely will it become that the, post the flap, the back flap of the book actually says the German automotive industry, and I, when I talk about German, I'm talking about also a lot of other traditional car makers, already lost the battle. They just don't know it yet. Yeah? Uh, so. This is, I mean, we always bring up the Nokia example or so, yeah, which is already kind of lame, but uh, when you look at disruptions in different industries, it always goes like that, and they have very rational reasons, those, tr those traditional car makers, to make certain decisions. They are operating here with managers that are basically in the office, of, uh, CEOs for four years. They're measured on metrics for short-term gains, yeah, increase my shareholder value. That's why General Motors, the guys, spend six billion dollars on uh, 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 buyback to buyback shares. Yeah, while 
the new automotive companies here operating with the founders. It's a very different view. So entrepreneurs versus managers. They are completely differently measured. So they, they have no chance from the beginning. They are set up to lose, and they think they have a lot of money, uh, you know, six, million, six billion dollars, ten million billion dollars profit, but this goes down quickly as soon as the sales break, break down. Now the self-induced, self-inflicted uh, diesel scandals, all these kind of things coming up. The situation is um, um, turning quickly and into a moment where they are not... The Mercedes EQC that they introduced yesterday, or they did a few days ago, was a disappointment uh, when you compare it. It had, had basically the car has performance data that Tesla had in 2012, six years later. Yeah? They're coming with a car that comes out in 2019 that has performance data that Tesla had in 2012. Um, for price, that's the same range. Yeah? So, the compliance car. Last question. Last question back here. Uh, is uh, product life, product life. So, how do you expect? Is it longer than conventional tar conventional car, or how often do we? Have great, great question. So, I was I was a few months ago in uh, Germany at a conference for the uh, car body builders association or so, and the question was, so how do we have to build autonomous cars? How they are different? Yeah. So today, a car on average lives for 12, 15 years uh, before it is being replaced. That's kind of the cycle. Yeah? Some live longer, some live shorter. Uh, but they basically drive, they are built for longevity. <laughs> They're built for parking around, <laughs> standing most of the time, you know, 23, uh, really 95% of the time being parked, 5% being driven. That's how they're designed and how they're built. Uh, autonomous vehicle in a shared model, like a robotaxi, will be built for intensive use in short periods, yeah? like 10 hours, 12 hours every day usage for two years. So we will come faster to a cycle, like a development cycle like we have for phones, where also new features are being basically introduced quicker. Uh, so that means also that it has um, challenges for the car body, for locks that you build in, how the doors open, how the equipment has to, you know, the, the leather seats, the seats, how they have to be cleaned in such a situation. So there's a lot of changes in how you do that. Now, we're talking always about passenger cars, but think about with autonomous technology, we can also have, we saw the delivery robots. Just think of it, not just a delivery robot, the whole supermarket on wheels comes to the front of your house. Yeah, like, like this shuttle bus in there, you open up, take your vegetables out. So we suddenly see a lot of different other uh, usages coming there that will change the way, not only we how we design the car, but also for what use and how intensive use it will be. Thank you very much. Uh, I will be here a little bit more for questions. So uh, thank you for coming. Have a good evening. <laughs>